Uh, so we'll get started. So I'm happy to be here with you today, uh, Lindsay. Lindsay, is it uh, Lindsay Michelle? Is that how you pronounce? Or yeah, Michelle's actually my middle name, but then I created a business name with my first and middle name. So a lot of people actually call me Michelle when I'm out and about <laughs> in the world. <laughs> okay. And that's okay too. When I was in Spain, that was easier to pronounce than Lindsay in Spanish. So <laughs> how do you say Lindsay in Spanish? Lince. Lince. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's like a lynch. L-I-N-C-E would be like the direct translation, like an animal. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> well, happy to, uh, you know, be in this conversation with you today. I know you wanted to talk and we're we're both big into the mental health space. And so uh, we can start wherever you would like. And I'm happy to see where this conversation unfolds. I mean, this is something that I'm sure you and I can both talk at great length. So wherever you want to begin, it's fine with me. Yeah, I just like to start today by honoring the fact that we're between two eclipses. I'm not going to go into too many details, but lots of big changes going on, probably internally for us both, but also in the world. Um, so for anyone out there that's watching this in a you know timeliness of around the early November, um, if you're seeing big changes in weather patterns, in politics, in finances, or in yourself and in your relationships or your career, that's all very normal right now. <laughs> Expect the unexpected. <laughs> Awesome. And as you're saying that, why don't you share a little bit more about uh, where you find yourself uh, experience or where, where your knowledge base comes from and what you like to uh, incorporate? Because, of course, in this world of mental health or mindfulness, what I personally discovered is there's so many different perspectives of it. And so I would love to have you start with yours. Thank you. Yeah. Um, energetically. So I've studied Reiki and trauma-informed healing. So I think from an energetic perspective is where I generally come from when I was speaking about the eclipses, that's astrology. Each of us is built very differently. So we respond differently to different things going on in the world, our day-to-day -day interactions, um, not necessarily directly from a psychological perspective. I know you have your own perspectives that I'm sure you're sh you'll share as well. Um, Physically, obviously I teach yoga as well. And so sometimes people respond to different things and they feel it physically. People say in their bones or they might have a anxiety response to something and we don't always know what that looks like or what that feels like or can put words on it. Um, so I think it's very interesting to look at the way people respond to different situations um, based on their physical reaction and then also maybe a thought pattern. Um, and I'm going on a tangent here a little bit, but I'd love to hear your response as well. Yeah, well, I'm curious. What I like to hear is what I, I always enjoy hearing people's stories, the beginning of the journey, what got us oh. in. Well, most of us, we don't come into the world picking up these kind, this kind of information, these kind of books. So <laughs> Lindsay, what got you into the world of energy and astrology? Yeah, great question. Um, the energy piece has probably been there all along. Um, there's a few specific synchronistic moments that happened for me. Um, I went and saw um, a person that, um, you know, I'll give you the information in advance, um, that still is here in Madison, Wisconsin, that was doing a class on auras. And I had his book and he could see auras. And that was probably when I was 20 years old. And 10 or 15 years later, no, 13 to be exact, I found the book again. I still had it. And I had his business card inside of it. And I thought, oh, he's probably not around town anymore. And then I had won an award at work and I had to buy a dress and I went to the mall and I didn't know where to find the dress for the life of me. So I found this woman and her daughter and said, do you know where the dresses are? And she helped me go through the entire mall. And she said, I'm going to this, um, this class, um, with this teacher. And I said, are you kidding? And she said, would you like to go with me? And I said, I didn't think he still existed. I have his business card. I have his book, his drawings. And, um, that was, I think early in the year of 2019. And it was then that I realized that, you know, some things come back in different times of your life for a reason. Um, and that particular year was a really big jump, jump start for me on my healing journey has had many times in my life, but I went on to go to Costa Rica that summer to study yoga. And we did a little bit of Reiki in that training. And I came home and said, Oh, I think I need to go take Reiki class. And I did. And that's pretty much what jump started the whole thing. So I'd probably go back to that that one moment in the mall when I ran into someone. Um, and then I went on to go become a Reiki master and study energy in a different way. But when I got out of that class, my first level one class, I said, oh, there's a name for this. I've been doing this my whole life. <laughs> I just didn't know it had a name. And so it was very nice to put context on something that I had held within within me for so many years and didn't know how to 
share with others. And I think for a lot of people, no matter how they get into whatever it is, it's still a very personal journey. Um, you can put names on it, but everyone's gifts are different. And the way we can help people is, is very unique to each one of us. Yeah, agreed. You know, I have a similar story where it's that pivotal moment. And uh, mine was a, a friend of mine, a business owner who recommended A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. And it was a similar experience where you talk about putting context to something. And as I read this book and I started learning about awareness, the ego, the pain body, different modalities and how the energy, uh, negative energy works getting stored. So that's the pain body, negative energy that we keep. I'm reading through this book and just felt like for the first time the world made sense. And it was these experiences or deeper questions I had when I was younger that I didn't understand. And, you know, reading this book started to put context to it. And I felt like as odd as this may sound, I felt like had I understood what I was experiencing when I was younger, early on, I could have wrote this book. And of course, I think that's what happened with Eckhart or any of us, you know, you start to understand. And so you can then illustrate that context and share it with with others. So that was a big pivotal point. And then from there, I got recommended another book that went a little deeper. I learned about non-dualism. And then from there, I was, I was just I guess in a way obsessed with it or, or very much enthused about getting as much of this as possible. And I started exploring and still to this day, many aspects of the mind and how people worked. And what I found fascinating is how much we actually do understand and how much of this has been studied and researched and backed. And, you know, a, a recent book I just finished was Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, which was written over 2000 years ago. And I'm reading this book and it couldn't be more relevant to the information I read that's by Eckhart or newer books that are published today. So truly this information goes back since the beginning of time. We just keep recycling it and telling it through different perspectives. Uh, I find it fascinating though, that it hasn't had a stronger uh, staying power or, or a further sort I'm trying to think of. Uh, I'm fascinated that it hasn't actually accumulated further into society, really, really taking a hold, uh, where you find more religious based following that has a very strong holding, it gets a strong following, uh, which is great. I think any practice of a positive nature uh, or positive design is awesome. I, f I find it interesting, though, that when you get more into like uh, spirituality or just energy, where it becomes more about each individual person, uh, that doesn't seem to keep as much of a of a group holding. It really comes to each his own. We all kind of stumble across these on our own on our own steps. Mm -hmm. I have a response to that. Yeah, yeah. I think of all the healing modalities as the same the same thing. They're just delivered in a different way. Whether it's physically, emotionally, um, you can you you know tangibly, you can use sage or different stones. And each one speaks to a different person at a different phase of their journey. And I think it's all just a, ch a different form of the same level of healing delivered through different channels. Yeah, agreed. And recently, the most uh, current book I'm reading now is getting deep and learning about neuroplasticity and how the brain maps itself and reorganizes itself, which is fascinating, at least for myself. I find it interesting that I actually am calm and, and it's a pleasant for me to read through this material where for others, it, it may be overwhelming or they get lost in the information. And what I think hearing from what you just said, regardless of what practice somebody follows or what context it's labeled, spirituality, a religion, which, you know, there's over a thousand practicing religions nowadays. There's there's probably thousands of different versions of spirituality. And, and then there's a practice that, you know, goes past spirituality where it's 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 just like Buddhism. It's it's not a it's a mental practice. You know, mindfulness being present, it's a mental practice. So it doesn't really fit into a specific context per se. Uh and I think what it all comes down to and what's showing us is regardless of what we call it, it's showing us the power of what the mind is capable of when we have certain intentions. 
So whether it's practicing Reiki, whether it's astrology, whether it's Buddhism, whether it's Christianity or Catholicism or Jewishism or, or, or spirituality or, you know, any of these thousands of names we can call it, I think unanimously what it's showing us is the power of the mind when it has a certain directional focus and attention and what's possible for ourselves. And we also see in society what what the destruct destructive possibility is when we have a opposite intention and focus. And I think that that is really what's at the at the core of everything that uh, we do in life. That speaks volumes. Um, and along with that, even visualization, I was just talking the other day um, about the idea of visualizing your day and then executing it um, with intention. And I think you can be really strategic in your actions and intentional, of course, um, as you go throughout your day. Um, and sometimes you can set the intention to simply be open and that something you know great is going to happen. Um, for example, my my neighbor and I, we had our house, next door house um, up for sale and we set an intention and prayed that we'd have some really amazing neighbors. And then I listened to my astrology and it said, you're going to get what's considered the best neighbor ever or the dream neighbor. And they were literally just moved in a week ago and it's been, dream, you know, like dream come true, just really great people. And I just thought like, wow, it's really cool to see those things play out in your life. And I think the more and more, um, I used to explain that. the more and more we have intention, the more those synchronicities become normal. And so instead of saying, wow, I can't believe that just happened. You're thinking synchronicity is my life. <laughs> these things happen to me always. And this morning I was running and these leaves have been falling down from the trees here because it's fall here um, in Wisconsin. And, you know, they look like, you know, snow is coming or rain. And this morning one fell, just one fell right in front of me. And I caught it when I was running and I didn't look up. I didn't look down. I didn't even know it was coming, but I caught it. And I thought like, that something's trying to tell me something right now, you know, why today of all things. And um, it's fun to just be open to all of those things when you live with intention and everything comes as a surprise, but it's really not that much of a surprise because you set the intention. Yeah. I've experienced that just so much when it first started <laughs> happening, these, you know, coincidences and you know, yeah. coming, coming into this mindfulness world, I was very much like when I first opened the new earth, I was very much a skeptic. My first mm -hmm. thought that was that this stuff seems too good. Why, why wouldn't everybody know this? And we live in a world where if it's too good to be true, it, it may be. And I think that's where I have such a strong buy-in and practice because it's so easily testable. If you take it on and think, okay, well, if this is really how it works, I'm going to, I'm going to prove this stuff wrong. And it happened the other way. It didn't, I didn't prove it wrong. It actually ended up being amazing in my uh, mental healing and, and just going through the world. And then I started noticing these synchronicities. And if we refer to the map of consciousness, which is one of the big tools that I use in my coaching and teaching, there's, there's 17 different levels, right? There's a higher mind, lower mind, and uh, the, the middle is courage, right? And so the bottom is shame and the top is enlightenment, right? And if you look at, uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's in peace, the, the vibration or the state of consciousness of peace, one of the indicators is synchronicity. And that's when you start to notice that when you're, when you're living from that experience, that expression. And when it first started happening, these, again, coincidences, it, it shocked me. It was kind of like, ah, well, maybe, you know, does this really mean that? Am I making more of a meaning to it? And then over time, I started noticing it so much that I began expecting it or even predicting it or seeing one thing and making a prediction like, huh, I wonder if this is going to translate to, you know, something else. And now it happens so much that it's irrefutable that it is something, especially when it starts involving other people. You know, mm -hmm. I find when you start having close connections with people, uh, there's just too many coincidences, coincidences to ignore and, mm -hmm. and how things sync up. Uh, and my theory of this, you know, it, this kind of goes into the law of attraction, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, we're all, uh, we're all energy, we're all matter vibrating, all our molecules and, and atoms are vibrating at certain frequencies, our consciousness is vibrating at certain frequencies. And we can even prove this in science by brave scans and, and the frequency our, our brain waves are going. And we know through the law of attraction that like attracts like. 
And mm -hmm. how I see us all going through the world is similar to echolocation. We're putting out this vibration. We're all putting out these ripple effects. <laughs> and it's, it's coming across the world, the universe, other people. And those that have like patterns bounces back. Mm -hmm. And so we find ourselves where we get attracted to those like frequencies. And this is mm -hmm. where you normally see that positive people will be attracted to other positive people. And then you mm -hmm. also see groups where negative people tend to attract to, to negative people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I find that when you set yourself at a, at a stable intention, right, you're at, you're at a consistent frequency over time, mm -hmm. things really start lining up. And people like your, yourself and, and myself, we start meeting each other and we start staying connected to one another. And then mm -hmm. you find somebody else of a like mind and you keep that in your network. And pretty soon we start growing our own kind of network or community of this like mind. And, and that's that gravitational effect that I find. Mm. And you really hold each other up too. what I find when you have that. It's like um, you're kind of keeping yourself in this level of functioning. I don't know how you would explain that energetically. Um, but I, to play devil's advocate, I'd love to ask you a question and hear your perspective on it. Yeah, sure. How do you explain when you elevate your consciousness and then think you've changed and things fall away? So we're in Scorpio season now, death and rebirth. Um, so when you find, I would, it's a, it's a double-edged question. How would you explain bad things happen to good people? And you don't have to have a direct answer, but the second part would be, um, as you're elevating and changing, yes, if people are growing with you, then you keep that bubble with you. But then there are times when different things fall away. And I think, um, what I've learned over time is, uh, just being okay with that, you know, and knowing that you've, you've changed. I know I'm just kind of throwing a curveball at you right now. <laughs> yeah, no. So the, I hold two things there. How do you explain the things happening to bad people and, and things falling away and changing is what I got out of that. Bad things happening to good people. Sorry. Bad, bad things happening <laughs> I think I said people. it backwards. Uh, all good. Uh, well, that first part of it is heavily interpreted. So what we consider bad is something that we're interpreting when there hasn't been a follow through. Uh, so there's this, uh, there's this story and I'm going to roughly paraphrase it because I don't remember it verbatim. And it speaks to that you know, good or bad things and how we characterize that. And so it was this, it happened, it was a father, father and a son in a town that, uh, in some place, again, I'm, I'm going to roughly paraphrase this. And so the son is out and about, they live on a farm and the son tending to, you know, whatever he had to do his chores for the day. And he ends up getting hurt and breaking his leg. And so people come over and say, oh, you know, such a bad thing. That's unfortunate that your, your son broke his leg and you know, I'm so sorry for you and this and that. And he goes, well, is it bad? Maybe. And so a week goes by and all of a sudden the war breaks out. And so there's a draft that they send out. Well, now the son has a broken leg, so he's not accepted into the draft. He doesn't have to go to the war. And then so the town people come by and say oh that's so good that he didn't have to go to the war and his legs broken and the father goes well maybe and so i think you can get the nature of this again i don't remember it that well i've only read through it once uh and i'm sure you can look it up it, and this story continues for about five or six different experiences where something happens and he goes well maybe and then you can see where good and bad I mean, until the story fully plays out <laughs> Yeah, there, yeah. There's no true good or no true bad. And then at the end of the day, when the life cycle is completed, mm -hmm. it's all an experience. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of good and bad is just how we're interpreting it at this moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you take on the experience of life and mm -hmm. you start stripping away the meaning that, that we give to a lot of things, mm -hmm. then good and bad tend to not really be so much of what is uh happening it's just that's what happened mm -hmm. uh, yeah that i've heard of that and i've also heard of and the and the description you gave of that story is a very much um in alignment with or lines up with the idea of you know something better will come along so if you think oh i really am forcing this opportunity or this job or whatever this might be or this you know house i want to buy and then it doesn't work out a lot of times people you know, are filled with disappointment because they don't know what's right around the corner. And so when you 
you know, live in faith or have trust that the next thing's going to come to you, it's usually better. And I used to always explain that as like, when you, you know, get rid of your rug because it's old, but you're really fearful to get rid of it before you have a new one. The, the whole idea is once you get rid of it, you realize, hmm, I, I thought when I still had that other one, I wanted blue, but now I want green. And then, you know, green comes in and you're thinking, well, that's really great. Um, but I think a lot of times people don't have the patience or they're a little worried about that gap of time of not getting what they wanted for the next best thing to come sometimes. Well, that's what it is. We, we, we struggle for this need to have control of things. And so if something doesn't go our way, we say it's bad. And something that I've noticed, and again, Eckhart totally speaks to this with the pain body, but I've noticed my own personal life, I noticed that a lot more bad things happen when I was in a negative mindset or when I was carrying this negative energy. So subconsciously, we're actually creating these quote unquote bad things in our life to self-validate the negativity and the negative stories we're telling ourselves. And mm-hmm. since practicing mindfulness, healing my mind, you know, raising my, my state of mind to be at these, these higher levels, so to speak, or, or higher mm-hmm. vibrations, mm-hmm. I've noticed that not so many bad things happen. And mm-hmm. when you start to operate from a place of understanding and learning and, and being introspective, Mm-hmm. Even something that seems bad, like, for example, I was on a trip this past weekend, and it wasn't ideally what I would have liked it to be. <laughs> However, I learned so much through that experience. And you talk about synchronicities. I I get this deep sense that my trip went exactly how it was meant to go. I really mm. do. Uh, mm. And so I don't worry so much about that experience. I have a heavy concentration on how I can be uh, the best I can be for myself so that out of that experience, out of that learning, I like to subscribe to the phrase that all is well, that ends well. And sometimes Mm. part of the process is just unenjoyable. And that's the process. It doesn't mean that the overall experience or journey or outcome can't be fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think of them. I I like what you said. And I also think as it's happening, I think of it as a message or a sign. And I always say, take note. Or if I tell clients that like, just write down what happens in the next few days. And I always used to explain it with like, it was a red scarf or a red glove. Like you're on a walk and you just run into something kind of funny on the street. And you're thinking, well, that's weird. You know, a color, a number, whatever it may be. And it's very interesting. Even on Halloween, we were trick or treating and I saw a lot of the one one, houses with four ones, like one eleven or 1111 was their address. And every one I commented, I was like, well, you have a really great, you know, house number for numerology. And a lot of them were like, well, I lived in another house with this number and I had lived in one as well. And I still don't know the meaning of all that to this, to, you know, four days later. Um, But as it's going on in, you know, so quote unquote, you know, bad way or experience that, like you said, you didn't have in in mind or an intention or it's, you know, you're not controlling it, I suppose. Um, there's usually a lesson there and something to be learned that's giving you information. All of it's just little clues to that end story. Um, that's how I view it at least. So instead of thinking like, oh, I can't believe this day is going this way. You're thinking, oh, well, I, you know, I missed that bus, but then, you know, this neighbor came and said hello or whatever it may be. And it usually always, like you said, you'll see it in the end, but you know, who knows when that end is. And I guess in astrology, a lot of times it's, there's cycles, you know, that are happening. They're all different amounts of time. Yeah, I had something recently happen where I think a lot of people would see it as bad or inconvenient or be upset. Uh, I was recently on a trip and uh, accidentally, (laughs) (laughs) did not realize it, flew into the wrong airport Uh, because (laughs) some cities have more than one. And when I got off the plane and I go to map, uh, you know, from getting to the airport to where I needed to go, I was like, why am I 40 minutes away? That doesn't make sense. It was a 10 minute Uber drive last time. Uh-oh. <laughs> and come to find out I was at a different airport. And so a lot of people, again, that could be a bad thing where, you know, and me five years ago, oh, I would have been completely frustrated and stressed out and think about, you know, what it cost me and this and that. And again, just practicing this for as long as I have and trusting in it. And also realizing being in a negative state is now not going to help me. It became just an experience. It became something to learn from. It became, you know what? 
the next time I look at an airport, really make sure that that's the one I'm going to. And for all I know, that saved me so much more trouble in a distant future I can't see yet, where mm. I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen again. So it's, you know, and there was other, you know, a lot of things that happened actually over this past week that was just really interesting how things, how things lined up. Uh, I do have a question for you because I have a friend of mine who's, who's interested in this. And so, and it seems to be more in your field. So I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, I would love to hear more about what you think about astrology and especially when it comes to uh, pairing of individuals, like relationships. A lot of people look at that compatibility. Uh, so yeah. I would love to hear your take <laughs> on that. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, I've seen some very beautiful charts, <laughs> but it takes a person to live up to their chart. I'll just say that with a lot of gusto. Um, an astrology chart is like a map is kind of how I see it. You know, there's a lot of things on there that can say that there is, uh, there are compatibilities where uh, people could get along really well, or they, you know, they can even map out, you know, how you might disagree, how you might have a disagreement with a person, for example, you know, someone might be more fiery and someone might be more quiet. Someone might use more words. Someone might take action, for example. Um, so that, that's a great question. I think um, it can be really, really helpful to get information in advance. Um, if you're looking at it from that perspective, if you take out all emotion and you just put facts on the table, um, I'm actually a moon in Capricorn, so I can be very, very, um, not good at putting names on emotion. So if I come across, it's just kind of like that. Um, so that's, that's a great question. I think it can be really helpful. I like to use that information, um, to understand a person, for example, um, if someone, I'm trying to think of an example of like, if you look at someone's North node, that's like their mission where they're headed towards in life. And so it will explain, and, and it's about a two to two and a half year. You can look up by a birth date. You don't need a whole chart. Um, it'll explain where they came from, all the gifts they came into this earth with, and then it'll explain the direction they're meant to go with it. So my South nodes in Scorpio actually came in with all the gifts of the whole idea of, you know, the quote unquote, um, the things we're talking about energy and astrology and all of these things that were kind of hidden, hidden realm type of um, a taboo subjects in a way. And my North Nodes in Taurus is going toward like stability, finance. <laughs> so it's very different. So you could meet a person and understand where they're coming from a lot better when you know about their chart and how it aligns with yours. And you maybe you want to ask me more specific questions or um, on what you're at, you know, what you're looking for in a response. Um, and it also helps you gather information about like a, a bigger life path maybe as well, but on a intricate level, it can explain how a person, um, might handle their emotions or like your rising sign is a face you show to the world. It might show you a little bit more about why they act a certain way in public or how they're perceived by others or how they deal with their emotions. And people are very, very, um, watery in a water science um you know they they have a lot of emotions and they're great at you know explaining them and maybe they're tapped into their emotions um more easily than others um and some people might have a hard shell so that's harder to access and so you can say oh that's why they're acting that way i understand them and then you can approach it differently um in communication i think um rising moon sun yeah maybe elaborate a little bit more if you want <laughs> Yeah, no, that that uh, that fulfills. It was it was yeah, more of a general question on uh, your view on compatibility and and how signs may play a part to that. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll add one more about my first comment because that was kind of a he heated comment. It was more like you can have a lot of great things in your chart. I do think that everyone's path of healing is really important. So when I say like someone might not live live up to their chart, it could be like. This person has all of this inside of them. They have potential, like untapped potential, but it's up to the person when you talk about intention to go through their healing journey because then you can repeat patterns. So I think it's it's twofold. You're given this gift of, you know, how the stars were aligned in the moment that you were born. And also you have your own work to do. So here's, I got a follow-up question. Great. If you're, <laughs> yeah, let's say you meet someone that first impression you like and and seems like there's a strong possibility and then you see that on the chart it shows that your signs are incompatible 
would you be more deterred uh, on the potential for that relationship as opposed to two signs that are compatible? Yeah, great question. I'm kind of the person that's like, um, live things to try them out to prove it to yourself that it's right or wrong. And it usually proves right, the chart. <laughs> um, so like if you get <laughs> two really strong signs and they, you know, they're kind of butting heads because they want to be the center of attention and they realize like they can't really, you know, play that out in real life because only there's only, you know, one stage and it fits one person, then that's really, you know, challenging. Um, however, I do think it takes time, you know, to get to know somebody. And so sometimes, Ooh, I guess I, there's no way to put this lightly. Um, we're specifically in a moment now that's make or break. So right now relationships are going to be confirmed that they're working or they're going to be very like in a split second, you'll realize, nope, that's not going to work. My path is this direction. and This is not going to be in alignment with my path. And it'll be very like starkly obvious. Um, and sometimes I feel that if I know that information and I'm, you know, meeting someone and I share that, then they don't always appreciate that information, but it, it is good to know that. Um, so in, it's kind of twofold, like you can try it out. And I think that, you know, the stars can align that it's going to work. And there's also times in life where a pattern is playing itself out. So a couple of months will go by and it'll be like, everything is great until one day it's not. And then all of a sudden that information from the chart will say, will prove itself in 3d life. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So I've kind of seen both, I guess an astrologer would maybe tell you different. <laughs> yeah. No, I get it. It makes sense. Awesome. Yeah. It's worthwhile researching though, just to, just to see, um, you know, if you kind of run them together, you can get some information, which is, I mean, more information is always useful. I you know some people feel that it could, you know, bias your opinion about a person, like you mentioned. So, you know, not knowing those things could be helpful as well. And just like, mm, kind of trusting what you're experiencing versus trying to get, you know, quote unquote dirt on somebody. <laughs> You know? Yeah, you talk about trusting what you're experiencing. And, and that's something that I find. So usually when I'm working with people, they're they're For the most part, there tends to be a lack of trust in themselves. Mm. No, oh, different in themselves? Than, yeah, no different than, you know, prior to my uh, practice of mindfulness, I had a lack of tr trust in myself. And what we find okay. in the world is that most of us, we accumulate a lot of reasons for what we do. Uh, and what I learned semi recently was the distinction between what making a choice is as opposed to making a decision. And most people don't actually make a choice or don't make choices in their life. They make decisions their entire life. Uh, and what I find is choice comes from our free will. So trust in ourselves mm -hmm. and where a decision comes from these reasons. We do something because reason one, two, three, four, five through whatever. Yeah. And since practicing that, what I found that by making choices, you begin to tap into your intuition. When you mm. start, when you remove the reasons to why you're doing something mm -hmm. and just choose it freely, over time, you really, I found that you, you dial into that, that energetic intuition. It's like that if you're doing something and you get that icky feeling, that pit in your stomach, you're like, ah, there's, this is probably not beneficial for me. Yeah. Uh, and I found that as the guiding compass. And so I've, I've used that. I've been using that often. And I found that when I start to feel uh, an unpleasant sensation, I've been trusting that. And so far it is, it is shown to be quite accurate uh, when it comes to, what I do in, in any aspect of life. And even if it's taking a drink out of the refrigerator, like just, just really trusting that I don't need a reason on what I'm picking. Uh, I already intuitively understand what it, what it is I, I want. And, you know, that's a harmless example. You can scale that up though, to other selections uh, in life. But it takes practice in the little things. I think of it as a, uh, as a skill. And I explain to people, um, is if you can if you can master the skill in those small decisions, it's much easier to use that in the big decisions. So the glass of water, for example, or a drink out of the fridge, whatever it may be, you know, red or blue, or you know, is it, you know, is it an apple or an orange, or am I turning left or right? I've been doing that since I was, you know, since I learned how to drive. Actually, I was like, should I go down this road or that one? Um, I I have a question on that though, because the the gut intuition I think is very important, and that feeling in your stomach. And I also wonder, 
in my own learning um, and for others is how do you know that you're not having, having like getting triggered and having a response from something else that's completely unrelated to the current moment. And it's just triggering you and you really need to work through that versus hmm, is that intuition or is this just a past trauma that's coming up? That's a great question. How, how you get clear of that is discovering what your triggers are. Uh, so and mm-hmm. one of the, uh, that's one of the processes I use in my coaching is having helping people go through of what the key traumas are mm. in life. And by trauma, it's not always like severe. It's not, you know, we're, I'm speaking trauma to the brain, not yeah. trauma. Like you were abused as a child. Uh, so there's these key experiences that we go through in life uh, that signal certain defenses that we create for ourselves. Uh, it, it's, it's our fight or flight. It's what I tell people all the time is when we got born into this world, the brain didn't say, oh, it's 2022. We need to be like this. No, the brain's coming into the world, not knowing what environment's in and the base programming that we're set up for is to survive. And so if we grow up in a supportive, loving, nourishing environment, then those defenses don't activate uh, as intensely or may not activate as all in rare cases I found people where there's there's really not even something there for that experience they, they haven't had it uh, now in other cases if you grow up in an unsupportive unloving uh, you know harmful dangerous environment then these defenses activate very strongly and it's a single moment in which they're created uh, mm. so there's, there's already these key experiences that we understand where they are. So I help people go right to them to see what's there. And then you can look through triggers. Triggers are relatively easy to spot out because they're reactive and they operate from our lower mind. And that's where our defenses are created. And so if you're coming from, so our lower mind, if you're coming from an experience of, of shame, of, uh, guilt, apathy, grief, fear, anger, desire, pride, those are our lower eight state of minds. So one of the biggest indications that you can see if you're coming from a reactionary place is your experience. What are you experiencing? Are you, are you coming from fear? Are you coming from anger? Well, then that is a trigger. Right. Yeah. So that's how you can, and, and another, another way that you hone in on that. And I, you know, I can't, uh, I I don't want to use the word stress. I I can't emphasize this enough, especially when I'm working with people is really using that map of consciousness so that you can start to understand what experience you're having at any given time. Mm -hmm. Most people, we we think that we understand ourselves so well, or we we think we understand, for example, love, what that experience of love is, where Mm -hmm. most people only have a knowing of the story that we tell about love. The, the actual experience of love is is much different than this story we tell ourselves about being in love. Uh, and, you know, most people, when they think they're coming from love, they're actually coming from anger, mm. yet thinking that they're coming from a loving place. And, and mm. they're not one in the same. So it's really dialing in to understand where your experience is. And it's quite fascinating when you when you really start clearing the mind, because when you do get triggered and you get down to those lower states, mm-hmm. uh, like say anger, because right? mm-hmm. it never goes away. We're always capable of feeling anger. We're always capable of going down to those lower states. The mm-hmm. practice of clearing the mind is so that we're never held to be stuck in those states again. Yeah. And so, you know, on the rare occasions where if, if I get triggered to be angry, I can already feel that energy. So because of my understanding, there's a lot more power of myself to not allow that anger to express. And then Mm. as I process that energy, I can feel myself go through the different states. And I'm very careful not to, I do my best, you know, as human as anyone else, Mm -hmm. I do my best to not begin to act or behave in a way until I feel myself back into the upper levels, into the, into the higher mind. So when I start feeling acceptance again, when I start feeling love again, and I understand those experiences because I've done so much work at practicing them and I understand what it looks like, what my thought process is like, what my behavior is like. So by, Mm -hmm. you know, being introspective and really getting to learn and understand yourself, 
-hmm. you can begin having a calibration of where you're at and say, okay, okay, the way I'm thinking right now, that is not love. I'm here. Okay. And then once I feel like, okay, now I'm back at acceptance. Okay. This mm -hmm. is, this is a safe place to, to, uh, to communicate again, because the lower mind is destructive for uh, any kind of connection, any kind of relationships. And I highly value uh, the relationships I have in my life. And I know how I used to be. And I don't have a desire to be destructive for that anymore. Because what I find is that the most important thing in life is not the material world. It's not society's view. When it comes down to what creates happiness and fulfillment in our life, it comes down to the connections we have with other human beings, mm -hmm. to our to our parents, to our family, to our friends, to our significant others. That's what really matters at the end of the day, not what kind of car you're driving or what kind of house you're living in. Yeah, that's really true. I was going to ask earlier, now that you explained that, thank you. Um, the whole idea about getting in your own way or tripping yourself up or being afraid of success. Have you, um, so when sometimes I think the fear can come up when things are going really good and then people get scared. And so yeah. then they stop it. Yeah. Yeah. I've looked into that myself actually. Uh, cause I have felt that even with what I do and the fear of success, uh, one of it, one component is a fear of change. Uh, because of, as you succeed, things are going to change, you're going to to alter. And so we have this innate fear of, of change, we want things to stay the way they are. So that's one of the aspects fear of success. I also think another component of it is the responsibility as you become more successful, you are more responsible for things. So there's, there's more of a pressure there to maintain that where if you're kind of just lounging around life there's not much pressure i mean there's no it's not much of a high bar to you know put yourself to compare yourself to so those are the two big components when people have this this fear of success or uh i guess a third component would be self-doubt yeah fearing that you're not actually capable of it so it's oh. better to self-sabotage and be controlling that mm -hmm. oh I failed because of this as opposed yeah. to really giving it your all and then yeah. feeling like you were in good enough which is you know a fundamental negative thought that just about every human carries that we think we're not good enough. Mm -hmm. I have two things to respond to that. Um, one is the pressure can also be thought of as an honor. You know, like you're here to deliver, and it's it takes an honor and it's a, it's a dedicated practice to be given that gift or that opportunity to elevate essentially, or have this higher, um, I would think of it as like a higher level of responsibility. And with that comes a higher level of dedication to the self-care or taking, um, taking good care because you're there to help others. Um, it is a lot of, a lot on your back, I suppose, when you say the word pressure, um, I think it can be explained in many ways. Um, and the other piece, a lot of people struggle with is being seen because they can hide under thing, you know, um, I guess it's explained a lot as weight or clothing or doors closed, but then being really seen and open is a whole nother experience. And that's very vulnerable and in your success or in your growth or in your ability to go through change. Um, there's a, there's a level of being transparent, I would say. Yeah. That makes me think of the, uh, the fear that many have of public speaking. Uh, the, the phrase goes that, more people would rather be in the casket than deliver the eulogy. Whoa. And how, how I explain that comes from our ego and how we criticize and judge ourselves. And so much of the world, if not all of it is merely just us projecting ourselves out into the world. Hmm. And when we're judging other people, we're truly just judging ourselves. We're, we're projecting ourselves onto that person and we're judging that person as if that was us. So usually the the thought process goes, well, I would never do that. I wouldn't act that way. So we're, <laughs> we're acting as if that's us. And then we're judging ourselves and we're fooling ourselves thinking that we're actually judging of the person because we're thinking to ourselves that we that can never be us, which is not true. Uh, we're all capable of being each other. Uh, it's like it's like if you're you know 10 years old, and you're judging people that are bald 
all right, thinking that, well, I'm never going to lose my hair. And then you do. And it's like, oh, That's now those. I said bold. <laughs> it's bold to be bald. <laughs> yeah. And then see what happens is those judgments come back and then we have to eat those and that's that's what's destructive about judgments because we're in a way we're prejudging ourselves so now mm. you look at public speaking all right being in front of people having the spotlight the transparency well when you stand in front of a large audience like say there's a thousand people in the crowd what's happening is now that we're taking our mind and we're reflecting back a thousand judgments that we're creating upon ourselves, And so we get overwhelmed with the criticism that we hold for ourselves, thinking of what we think these other people are thinking. When at the end of the day, most people, if not everyone, are truly just always thinking about ourselves. And this is why it's so powerful to become introspective. Because when you can start controlling the, the thought that we give to ourselves, there's not much else in the world that is going to affect you. Yeah. I was thinking earlier when you were talking about all the emotions or states of being that you're explaining until you are able to respond to someone. Yeah. Difference between state of mind and emotions. Emotions and feelings are actually constructed in the brain and, and they're not actually a definitive aspect of who we are. It's an expression of, of what we're, what we're feeling. And mm -hmm. You know, most people that when we get stuck in these emotions, you know, a natural emotion only lasts about a minute and a half. Anything further than that, we're self-inducing with our mind. Oh. Yeah. And there's a great book on that. Lisa R. Bennett wrote it, How Emotions Are Created. It's just fascinating, the study and research behind that. Yeah. The emotions are learned or constructed. And, and we now experience in this day and age more emotions than we have before because our, our communication, our vocabulary has grown and spidered out. So we, so we have more of a diversity of, of how we experience emotions. And you can even look at other, uh, other countries that have different dialects where they have, uh, for example, uh, one that's getting more popular now is Higgy, which is, uh, uh, I think, a Norwegian uh, term or Swed Sweden. Is it Swedish? It means a uh, warm, cozy mood, you know, mm -hmm. being, being in a warm, comfortable place with a friend. Mm -hmm. and so, so because they have that, that language for it, that's an emotion and experience that, that those people have, where if you mm -hmm. come to the U S prior to hearing that you would never mm -hmm. experience that emotion. It's not there to be constructed. I think that minute and a half thing is pretty helpful for giving people the opportunity to learn how to not shove emotions down or stuff them and actually sit there and feel them. And if you think, oh, it's only 90 seconds, I can do this. I can do this. I can feel this feeling and it will, you know, dissipate if that's really what you're referring to. And in, in 90 seconds, it might be easier. Or well, emotions, it does. It, it, it processes through uh, it, when we're, when we're clear and we have a, a healthy mindset, the emotions you can feel feel them process and release. And mm. I can speak from experience as somebody who used to be really good at suppressing their emotions. You know, as a child, I remember holding on so strongly and pushing down uh, sadness where I could physically feel a lump in my throat as I, as I just muscled it down, not allowing myself to cry now, not allowing myself to, to feel that. And then I became so proficient at it that I stopped even feeling sad it was just an automatic I could just hold it down there and then oh. through my uh process of of healing I can tell you that that energy doesn't go anywhere and the more that you suppress there is uh an immense eruption that happens when you start to um, open those 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 cages or you know whatever you want to call it when when uh you know you open the lid on it and now okay. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, it was definitely like that. That was more than a minute and a half, I'll tell you that much. Uh, oh, for sure. It's built up for years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And what I can say now is that when I experience emotion or if I if I get in a state of if if I'm overwhelmed by something mm -hmm. or if I feel myself starting to cry, they're mm -hmm. all short lived. Uh, oh. you know, I can feel it go through. I may be sad. I, I may cry for a bit and it's never this drawn out saga. There is no, nothing like when I was a child, you know, trying to hold on to it or force it down. They really do just pass through. Uh, and there's a practice to that, to having ourselves open because that energy state, that sadness or that grief, right. It, it grief, needs yeah. to go through those, those states 
to process out into enlightenment in which, you know, stay in enlightenment. It's, it's not some mystical place. And I think a lot of the world may think that it's, it's merely being in a state lack of judgment. And that lack of judgment comes from a lack of identity, a lack of self. It's, it's mm. objective observation mm. and, and our ego and the judgments that come with it. That's, that's what they are. And, you know, not saying an ego is good or bad. It's just an identity. And some of us have more of that identity stacked than, than others. And some of us have more of an inflated ego than others. And it's the inflated ego that becomes problematic. It's mm. not identity itself. And then you talk about uh, earlier, we talked about triggers. Well, mm -hmm. the only thing that gets triggered, the only thing that becomes offensive to any one of us is the ego. So mm -hmm. if you think about anything that offends you in life, it's something that you identify with. And somebody's, someone's communicating a counter perspective that you disagree with. Mm -hmm. right? So for example, if you're a basketball player and someone criticizes you on that, on that notion or says, you know, you suck at basketball, or you're not good, well, that can cause offense, because mm -hmm. you may identify with I am a basketball player. Yeah. Well, if you carry that same identity, and somebody comes up to you and says, well, you suck at hockey, probably not going to feel anything. Because it's not <laughs> wrong sport. <laughs> yeah, it's not in your identity to react to. And so mm -hmm. that's where our reactions and our triggers and the offenses we take come from. It's, it's mm. comes down to identity. And that's one of the hard parts about practicing mindfulness or at the level that I, I teach and coach it, because if you truly want to get these higher experiences, then it becomes a process of relinquishing this, this falsehood that we, that we judge ourselves to be, because ultimately when we came into the world, there was no, I am yet it started getting stacked on top. You came into the world and you got a name. So you said, I am Lindsay. And then soon you realize what gender you were because most kids don't realize that until it's learned. And so then you have a gender, maybe a skin color. Then you start getting likes and dislikes and you, and you build your identity up based on all these things. You get older, you have a job. So you say, you know, I am an accountant. I am a doctor. I am an advisor. So you start building this identity through life. Yeah. Uh, two things came up for me as you were sharing that, uh, if I may. One was actually, um, I want to say it was a book on marriage written by a Christian author. And it says talking about marrying people for their soul, not their role. So if it was, you know, a professional athlete that someone, you know, was married to, and then they got cancer, they, you know, that person's identity has changed or who they show themselves to the world to be. Um, and you're still going to love them regardless. And so it's, you know, connecting with people because of who they are on the inside versus what you're saying, all of these things to identify us. And I think what I'm thinking of um, is, you know, how can we best, you know, disassociate or disconnect from these identi identities and be, I'll comment on your shirt, your own brand <laughs> of yeah. you. And, you know, what you offer and how you make people feel, um, I guess that's still partial identity, I suppose, but it's less than, you know, what you were speaking of prior. Yeah. Uh, the short answer to that is not being afraid of being nothing. Oh. Yeah. Because from nothing is where creation is, is manifested from. And so if you can, if you can have the trust to get back to, which where we came from, which when we're born into this world, we're born as, as a consciousness, as energy inhabiting this host body. And again, you go back far enough and you can see how our sense of self has been developed. Well, if you can have the trust to go back to that point, then that's how you, that's how you can disconnect. And then you can rebuild the identity and you can, you can recreate it. And that's when you can start becoming malleable with yourself and deep down, if you can understand where your true self is, then the identity won't, won't be a problem. Cause in society, I mean, it, it does help. It, it can, you know, it, it helps yeah. for it's, it's information transferring who you're talking about, identifying somebody. You, you go back years ago before people had names, which I'm sure there was a time period of that. If you just said, Hey, you and 20 people turn around, that's not really functional. So no. names became functional to be able to identify which you you're talking to. Uh, it's important though, not to, it's important to understand that that's not 
at the foundation of who you are. Like Nicholas is right. not at the foundation of who I am, which is why it would not be upsetting to me if somebody said my name wrong or people often ask me, what do you prefer, Nick or Nicholas? And I don't have a preference because yeah. it, it ultimately doesn't matter. If I understand that you're communicating to me, that's that's all that matters. If you shorten my name, long my name, call me Joe. If I know you're talking to me, I'm I'm fine. Same here. Yeah. And that's interesting too, because inherently who we are, um, I, I kind of go back to the happiness project. I don't know if you follow that at all, but they always talk about if you're an adult and you're looking to remember what you love to do, you know, for a pro you know, profession or even, you know, creatively in your personal life, um, go back to when you were 10 years old. And so who you are really inherently deep inside, it doesn't really change. You might become more calm as you get older. Um, but the th you know, the intricacies of you are at the heart of who you are. And sometimes our profession changes throughout our career, um, but who we are at the heart center, um, a, a is what people remember about you, and B is is uh, inherently, you know, built. I think in your DNA. To be honest, <laughs> it can express itself in different ways through you know different interests that you have or what you've been exposed to as a as an, a child, adult, or person. Um, but yeah, 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 that was great. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, you know, briefly, I'll, cause this can get into a whole nother conversation you talk about <laughs> our DNA. So I don't think many of us realize either how our DNA is affected by our state of mind and our state cool. of mind has the power to turn on and turn off certain genes. So yes. we're not predestined by our DNA. It's kind of, it's, it's similar to what you said about the astrology maps. You know, there's a certain opportunity for who we could be or what can be expressed in those genes However, our state of mind has a lot to do with which genes get expressed more than others. Uh, and, and this is what changes our, our growth and our evolution as we reproduce. There's, there's so mm -hmm. much more at play. Uh, and it would be nice one day if we actually started to uh, build upon this, because if we had an intentional focus as a species of, of what we're doing for ourselves, I think that humanity has such a potential that I think is so much further than any one person realizes. And I think it would take thousands of years to see that. So I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. I just think the organism of human just has such a potential that far exceeds where we are today, given how much technology we've, we've created. And so one of the things I, I think about the world today is that even though technology is enhancing uh, quite uh, yeah, quick pace relatively nowadays. I feel that humanity is not advancing as much as technology is. Well, you're going to see big changes in the next five days <laughs> until that November 8th eclipse. Um, I think there's a, there's another side to what you said, and it's really just, you know, the opposing feature is you can turn on genes through your state of mind. You can also turn off Pre, if you have a predisposition to high cholesterol, for example, or heart attacks, and same with the astrology piece is like, hey, this is an information um, data point or map or whatever you want to call it that you can use and you can counteract some of the negative things or enhance some of the positive things. And some of them are simply by lifestyle. And like you were saying, state of mind. <laughs> yeah, here's a fun fact for you and <laughs> our, our viewers, whoever they may be, 75% of our aging is within our control. <laughs> Only 25% of that comes down to genetics. And I'm so. counting my gray hairs. <laughs> <laughs> so much stress. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can see it. There's some people that you can see that are 25 and they look 50. And there's mm. some people that you can see that are 50 that look 25 or, you know, in, in that, in that level, you can really see life over time begins to show on people and it gets less and less hidden. Uh, on people's faces it's it's and oh yeah again that's not even a theory at this point and I don't have the reference of the article however you know do a quick google search and I'm sure it'll come up I, that actually goes back to I was thinking two things you referenced from the beginning was one about intention and the other piece was explaining um something about why society hasn't caught up um maybe through the way we run our jobs or our lifestyle I can't remember what it was originally but it was related to that like the sometimes the stress is put on because you know the the normal nine to five work schedule is really not conducive to longevity <laughs> of life when we're sitting all day um depending on you know what you're needing to do to keep yourself lively and young um 
but I think sometimes, like we said, the state of, I'm going to kind of deviate here a little bit. The state of mind is a piece. And I used to always say, um, don't make decisions from that stressed state of mind. If you can get yourself to the mental calm. And for me, it used to be always after a yoga class, I make decisions differently and I bring a different, um, more peaceful version of myself to the table. And then at that point I can, because I'm running a different energetic uh, resonance, I guess you could use at that moment, my interactions will be different guaranteed. And so then if I wait to make that phone call for one more hour or two more minutes, I'm going to have a different response from the person on the other end or a different person might even answer the phone. And so then that can actually, it, it's really cool to see how much going back to intention, but how much control in a way or potential opportunity we have to have our story play out in a really positive way, or not to go back to positive and negative, but we, we have a lot of opportunity there to have things play out uh, to our favor, to help us and use them as um, support. So I think, you know, a lot of the chakra system relates to feeling supported by the universe. And when we go into life every day, feeling that way, a lot more support will come versus thinking, oh, I have to do this all on my own. And no one, you know, everyone's out to get me, um, and the world's against me. And then you're, you're fighting this uphill battle. Um, but I think all of those things come into play to set yourself up for success, for having that little, you know, nest of, you know, bouncing back. Um, and part of that is how quickly can you get yourself out of that state of mind and into, into a different state of mind throughout the day even. Well, yeah, because all these states, they have different energy, energy uh, uh, that's getting transmitted and we can feel that. And I'll use a, an easy contrast as an example. If you're coming from a state of anger, that in a way has a, a, a whole unique dialect. You think differently in anger, you're speaking differently, your tonality, and it gets sense. Whether you understand what we've talked about or not, you can you can sense it. There, there's something off that's there if someone's in anger. And anger is fifth up from the bottom in our state of mind, a state of consciousness. It's in our lower mind. So now if we move up the scales a little bit, we go to love. Well, if you're coming from love, love thinks differently, is a different tonality, is a different expression. And so these different energy states can be felt and they play out whether someone recognizes it or not. If, if you're speaking to somebody in an angry tone, it's not going to be the most progressive conversation. And you're probably going to have a harder time through that conversation. However, if you speak to somebody through an experience of acceptance or reason or love, you're going to find that 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 conversation and that outcome is going to be a lot easier to go through uh, than the the former. Uh, and, and this takes self-control. It takes power. It's It's where our power truly resides and and being able to hold our energy stable and calm and, and balanced and centered as opposed to the state of anger where it's more destructive and out of control and, and you don't have that power over yourself. You're now at the mercy of, of this induced uh, emotion and irrational thinking and, and higher level of judgment. Yeah, that's a discipline. That takes a lot of, when you think about control, it takes a lot of self-control, but it also little bit of boundaries, you know, if someone's sometimes you could feel like phone calls and emails are coming at you and yeah. then choosing when to. Well, this goes back full circle to where we started. It's, <laughs> it's the practice. It's the, it's the mental practice of intentional focus and direction, which we can say is mental fitness. Just <laughs> like yeah. it takes discipline to have a uh, uh, overall you know, uh, uh, physique that, that is, uh, how can we say this, uh, well kept, all right, going, going to the gym regularly or working out or yoga or any kind of physical practice that takes consistency and discipline and there's no yes. shortcuts around it. And so that's yeah. physical fitness. And we understand that and we can see the difference in people of those who practice physical fitness and those who don't. Now, one of the harder lenses to understand because it's not as tangible is mental fitness. However, when you uh, are able to practice mindfulness meditation, meaning practicing just being, not, not guided meditation, really honing in on objective observation, 
then you can start to see that mental fitness. And some people have a strong mental fitness and some people are mentally weak. Now that doesn't show necessarily physically in the body where you can see someone who's quote unquote out of shape or in shape. You can see through their communication, through their way of being, through yeah. through just how they are in the world. And, and yeah. so if we can start to understand that there's a mental fitness component as well as a phys physical fitness component, then I think that's going to be the next step on uh, society really understanding the power of the brain, what it's capable of, and that, uh, and I can tell you just from, I mean, if not more than ever, going through and understanding neuroplasticity is well confirming that the brain acts, whether it is or isn't, it acts exactly like a muscle. And that's a whole other conversation right there. To be continued. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> gotta have a cliffhanger. Excuse yeah, me. let's uh we could we'll close it there. Uh <laughs> I would cut. That's what I do. I'm gonna I keep saying I'm gonna get one of those markers. I haven't gotten one yet. <laughs>